Hello and welcome to Hawkeye Nation. This is Hawkcast, your Iowa football, basketball, and recruiting podcast brought to you by Go Iowa Awesome and Rivals.com. I'm your recruiting analyst and host, Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by Adam Jacoby, publisher of the site, and of course, managing editor, Ross Binder. Before we get started, make sure wherever you are listening, hit that subscribe button. If you're on YouTube, drop a like, drop a comment. Let us know what you're thinking about Iowa sports. Did we miss something? And of course, you can always let us know what you're thinking um, on all the things we're talking about today. WNBA draft the portal for men's and women's basketball and spring ball right around the corner for football. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, make sure again you hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to leave that rate and review. It helps us out on all of those platforms. Now, to get us started, WNBA draft, Caitlin Clark, of course, goes number one in uh, in the draft, followed by Kate Martin in the second round. Ross, uh, you, you wrote those recaps for us, so uh, you, you were watching live. I had to take advantage of the nice weather and was out golfing, so we uh, recorded it and went back and, back and watched a little bit. But um, tell me your thoughts. Uh, I mean, did you, did you expect Caitlin to go number one? <laughs> You know, I mean, it was a, sh a real shocker that Caitlin Clark, the best basketball player uh, in the country, uh, went as the number one pick in the WNBA draft. I don't know that anybody saw that coming, but no, I mean, it was it was the worst kept secret since probably since the at least since the day she announced she was going to go pro after, you know, the, the just concluded season, um, you know, when she made that decision. And uh, Indiana already had the number one pick. They'd won the draft lottery at that point. Like it was extremely obvious that they were going to be taking Caitlin Clark and there was no other rational pick to even rational pick to be made, even though this is an extremely deep and talented WNBA draft class. I mean, there are a lot of really good players that got taken last night um, and will boost the, the talent in that league for years to come. But I, you know, we've said it all year. Caitlin is a one of one. She is, you know, one of the most unique players we've ever had the privilege, I think, uh, to watch and cover. And, you know, now she's just taking her talents to the next level. And she was the obvious choice. Um, Indiana did not waste any time making it, um, which, you know, sidebar, uh, shout out to the WNBA for running a very smooth and impressive draft. Amen to compared that. To, the Holy Spirit I mean, just took over me. If you guys were wondering what that was, <laughs> Amen, Hallelujah. I mean, compared to just the the NFL draft, which is you know a three day marathon of just you know endurance, uh, the WNBA knocked that thing out in like two hours and fifteen minutes. I think like it was it was a model of efficiency, but. Um, yeah, the Caitlin thing was not surprising. The Kate Martin, I it was certainly was hoping she would get drafted because she was a another phenomenal player for Iowa this this past season and obviously her whole career. But you know, I wasn't sure that she would be a, a draft pick. So to see her get taken in the middle of the early part of the second round, I think actually uh, by Las Vegas was uh, really impressive and a a tremendous credit to you know what she's done and and how she's worked uh this whole season and her whole career um adam what did you think of uh of kate going in the second round and, and the whole wnba draft yeah I, I i thought um i i was pleasantly surprised that, that martin went as high as she did uh i i had actually stepped away to pick up uh dinner when she got picked like two picks before she went because i thought she was a third round pick and, and that's no disrespect to, to Kate or anything like that, but this is the WNBA and it's such a physically demanding league with so few roster spots that if you're not great at something, like capital G great at something, up to and including athleticism, and, and you know, Kate Martin is good at athleticism, but if you're not great at something, it's really, really hard to stick. And so I figured that it would be something closer to, you know, Monica Zanano's um, draft day experience, which is, you know, go in the third round, get yourself a little bit of time in front of the coaches, let them see what you have to offer and, um, you know, sort of hope for the best. And, and if not, 
you know, see you over in Europe. And so for the aces to take that kind of look at Martin uh, that early, at the very least, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about one of the all-time great rosters, not only this year, but in WNBA history. So I'm not optimistic for Martin to make that roster per se, but even if she doesn't, you know, it took Megan Gustafson a little bit to, to stick in the WNBA, but she has stuck. Uh, and, you know, it's also a situation where Kate and Martin doesn't have to be on the court to make this time in the WNBA or in professional basketball worth her while. She is going to be coached by Becky Hammond for as long as she's on that ACES roster. And for somebody who has designs very explicitly on being a coach after her career is done, who in that league would you rather be drafted by than Becky Hammond? So this, this feels like an unqualified win, even if Martin is not going to Indiana to, to continue to be Caitlin's uh, teammate. But I think on some level that might even be better for both of their developments too, that, you know, this stage of their careers are not together. They can grow individually. And, you know, it's not going to affect their friendship or, or, or anything like that. Uh, they'll, they'll be as happy as ever to see each other when they do see each other. But yeah, I, in, in terms of setting Kate Martin up long term, I, I think this is the best possible outcome she could have asked for. Uh, Elliot, would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I mean, for my ability and, you know, the amount that I've covered women's basketball, I think this was a win for Kate Martin and a win for for Iowa women's basketball, too. I mean, to see we, we knew Caitlin was going number one. Right. But to see a second player who was kind of I don't know, would you say she is the second fiddle on, on this team for, for lack of a better you know way to phrase it? Because she was awesome. But <laughs> Caitlin Clark was on the team. Right. Like, yeah. um yeah. She, she was awesome outside of the gravitational pull of Caitlin Clark. There we yeah. go. Okay. So to see that happen is phenomenal for Iowa women's basketball for future teams, because it's not just going to be everybody trying to be Caitlin Clark that ends up at Iowa. It's going to be, I can be Kate Martin, who was the glue. I can be, you know, Molly Davis, Gabby Marshall, who uh, some th folks thought Gabby Marshall was going to get drafted. She goes undrafted. Um, but uh, lots of lots of good happening for women's basketball and and for Iowa women's basketball specifically. So on the, uh, I'm sure you guys saw the viral video of Kate getting drafted. Um, they had her move to the outside aisle or the aisle seat, um, and somebody had to take her phone because they don't want them to be on their phone when they get drafted. Uh, the girl that got the video, the woman that got the vi the video is Aaliyah. I think her last name is Funshell or Funshell. So we got to give credit where credit's due. She's been covering female sports for a long time. She, I, she and I actually have followed each other for like the last five years. She followed me on Twitter um, and Instagram before I had a thousand followers on on Twitter. So that that'll that'll tell you. Um, I've never met her personally, but she's kicked absolute ass. For the longest time she's awesome if you if you want to cover women's sports if there's anybody out there that's wanting to grow in in media and and learn how to do it right follow Aaliyah and and follow her anyway because she's awesome she's going to be continuing to cover the WNBA and covering Caitlin and Kate probably um so so shout out to to Aaliyah um I've only had one interaction with her and it was when I was speaking to a college class at UNI and uh they asked about like somebody to write a profile on and somebody that you could learn from. And I was like, I can DM this chick for you. Cause she again, kicks ass and she's still kicking ass four years after I spoke to that class at UNI. So, um, shout out. I wanted to give a shout out to Aaliyah. I, I just thought that was cool. Hell yeah. 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 So is, is anything else we want to hit on for, for the WNBA draft before we move on and talk a little more specific Hawkeyes? Nothing. Y'all, everybody saw it. It's all cool. It's all over social media. Um, Caitlin being the first male or female athlete to be dressed by Prada for this event. My girlfriend thought that was cool. I don't know. I don't <laughs> um, it, it must be a big deal if they're going to mention it. You I know? Guess. Yeah. Yeah. Good for Caitlin. Uh, that's another thing for the record books. By the way, before we, before we move on, she sold out of size... Extra small, medium, large, 
extra large and extra extra large for her jersey i think on fanatics uh yesterday after she was drafted so small was left so i'm assuming they're loading back up and i'm assuming shields and dick sports and all the places in iowa i know west des moines uh they're uh the dick sports they're loaded up on on caitlin clark shirts so i'm sure you'll be able to get one one way or another um but just another testament to her continuing to break records and records and records and records WNBA draft as well. Viewer viewership, two point four million. Previous high was like five hundred thousand. Yeah, they 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 absolutely blew it out of the water, and and so a tough day for the people who continue to fight back against the notion that Caitlin Clark is not, or that is that Caitlin Clark is directly responsible for this growth. Like, you you, you can't keep denying it at this point. She has a transformational effect on people's interest in women's basketball it is as plain and simple as that there you go now to talk a little more hawkeyes basketball we'll start since we started talking about the wnba let's hit the uh portal for the women lucy olson on campus today at iowa as we're recording this on tuesday night uh the point guard from villanova and then maddie sure will be visiting later this week um adam you're our women's basketball beat writer so so tell us about what's going on there yeah so lucy olson is iowa's primary target and a pretty consensus top five uh transfer portal candidate now i was trying to fill a role at point guard and is losing not only caitlin clark but also molly davis as a ball handler so this is an obvious position of need and they've got some freshmen coming in but uh, both Olson and Sure are sure-handed ball handlers. Uh, uh, Elliot has just logged off. Now they, but they they both fill that role, even though they're not going to be filling Caitlin Clark's role because how how can you even try? Olson is somebody that I would sort of put closer to Molly Davis, maybe even a plus level Molly Davis, just in terms of her ability to be the focal point of the offense. Uh, Villanova lost a whole lot with Maddie Segrist, uh, who was herself an all-time career leading scorer. I think she ended up in the top 10. Um, But Villanova kept up that um, level of quality in their program by leaning on Olsen, who scored 23 points a game this past season. But she doesn't have that long range that Clark does, because again, who does? And by and large, that's not the way that she gets her points. If you look at her uh, the way that she shoots, uh, like the, the the breakdown of twos and threes, she's primarily a two-point shooter, uh, did not shoot well from behind the arc this year. She went from over 35% to a hair under 30% this season as those attempts started to rack up, as she sort of leaned more into this uh, primary ball handler role in the offense. But she is very effective inside the arc and creating her own shot um, fighting in among the trees for offensive rebounds, a little bit crafty, a, a little bit like Molly Davis, a little bit almost even like um, Roy Devin Marble. Uh, if you if you remember the way that he uh, created for himself within 15 feet, which was a little bit unusual for a ball carrying guard, but he made it work. Uh, now Olsen is a little bit on the smaller side. She's listed at five nine, and and from what I hear, that might be generous in and of itself. So again closer to molly davis you know in some other ways too but once you understand that iowa is not recruiting her to be caitlin clark 2.0 and is recruiting her for what she can do then you see the obvious benefits of of bringing in a player like that so she was on campus today uh just in time for the tornado warning (laughs) and uh we will see how that has gone so far but from everything we've heard Iowa has set their sights on Olson, and she even canceled a visit to Maryland on Monday to make sure, or postponed without a date. We'll, we'll put it that way. Um, I, I, they haven't used the C word, but it was a like, Maryland can wait. I'm headed to Iowa City. So we'll see how that goes. And then sure, uh, it will be later in the week, I believe uh, Thursday, and we'll see what updates come out of that. But again, we're, we're talking about a player who is um, confident with the ball in her hands and create for other players and sort of has that situation with a 
new coach coming in and bringing in Georgia Amor. Uh, obviously, that role is going to change for sure. So at, at Kentucky. So obviously, the portal is the right place for her to be. And um, I think Iowa would be smart to look at both of them. Uh, especially because they're both really one-year rentals at this point. Um, sure, would be using her COVID year, and Olsen is too young for it. So um, if we're talking about fourth-year players here who can provide a lot of leadership for what's going to be a very, very young backcourt. And if Iowa wants to keep that momentum going into 2025 when Addie Deal and you know those uh, players start to show up, this looks like a really good way to do it. Uh, Ross, have you heard uh, anything more about uh, Iowa's uh, recruiting on the women's front? No, I think you you nailed it pretty well. I mean, obviously, I think uh, backcourt is just such a tremendous need for the program right now is, you know, losing uh, Clark, Martin, and Molly Davis and Gabby Marshall uh, all out of that uh, guard rotation is a significant loss and you know you've got some players that can step up into bigger roles but especially that ball handler role and the you know initiating the offense uh and the scoring you know they're going to need to score points that's that's a you know trademark of looters style of basketball is they're going to run and they're going to score you know they not might not run as fast without caitlin but uh that's the way she plays it's just not gonna slow down into a defense first team without um, you know, Clark and everybody else. So if they're able to get um, those two, uh, those two girls, it would be a tremendous uh, addition to the program, really help fill some needs. And like you said, they, they don't need necessarily a long-term fill because they have some, you know, the recruiting has been excellent. Uh, they've got some great uh, people lined up to come in in future years. So they really just need a bridge through next year to try and, keep some of the momentum that, uh, you know, they built during this Clark era, uh, keep at a, as high a level as possible uh, until those freshmen start getting here and, and doing what they're able to do. Um, the, the one thing that I'll add to, to this whole discussion is in terms of the point guards that are going to be on campus or, or in that roster next season, not only is it a pretty young rotation, but we're also talking about Kenise Johnson, who's coming off of a pretty significant uh, knee injury herself uh, that was suffered this year. And then Aaliyah Guyton, who's part of the incoming freshman class uh, herself, had a, a pretty significant knee injury too. So this might be a situation where they might not be 100% going into camp. And so between that lack of experience and, and you know, if they're not playing at their highest level, you absolutely need that uh, more experienced um a ball handler as an as an option and really a starting option even if they don't really have that rapport with the rest of the team yet it's still a much much better situation to be in so for clarification purposes it's one or the other right or could they get both in terms of where the scholarship situation is currently it's looking like one or the other but you know there there's also a pretty long off season and so i do think that the way if if anybody decides to leave and and there are some, I don't, you, you never want to speculate on somebody without knowing that they've got one foot out the door. But if there were players that wanted to leave and, and there are a couple options that would make sense if they wanted additional playing time, then I think that additional opened up scholarship would be, a, it, it would be wise to use it on a second backcourt senior uh, graduate transfer but they also do need some help on the interior too so really i mean they they've got a lot of needs to fill here to say the least and and only ava hyden coming in as a as a big in the um in this year's recruiting class too so they they need some trees but they also need some experienced help in the backcourt now, with if they were to try to target both, that would make things a little bit crowded in terms of who wants the ball in their hands, though, frequently, sure. right? It would be pretty unlikely to get both. Well, it, you know, some of it's also going to depend on um, the way you share roles. You know, you can have two sort of ball-dominant 
guards if one of them doesn't really need it as much. Now, it might have a little bit of an effect on their scoring output. And, you know, we we saw what that did to Haley Van Lith's standing. You know, there one, it just wasn't a good fit for her at all, but it, at LSU. But but two, people notice when you're scoring dips, people notice when you're shooting dips. And so does Lucy Olson want to go back to scoring 12 points a game when she scored 23? Does she want, you know, fewer stats here and there? It's it's a little bit of a del uh, delicate balancing act, but we also saw South Carolina have like high level redundancy uh, to, for for lack of a better term at every sort of skill set that you could mention, whether it was a starter or a backup. You know, at some point, you are if if you really want to play at the highest level, you are going to have to share the roster with players who are as good as you at your best thing. So. Yeah, I, I think that is going to be sort of the the pitch from the Hawkeyes as they try to build their talent level up to these South Carolinas, to the UConns, to the LSUs, to be like, yeah, you would be great. <laughs> and we want three girls who are as great as you at like rebounding or at dribbling or at shooting. Like now here's the proof of concept that you you want as many talented players as possible to put together your 200 minutes and you know, you just sort of have to understand that your own personal stat wants or needs or how you balance all that out, you know, that sort of goes by the wayside. All right. So to the men, uh, we know Tony Perkins and Patrick McCaffrey have committed out of the portal. McCaffrey heading to Butler, which might mean something for a certain other McCaffrey. You could read about that if you're on the premium board at iwithoutrivals.com. Um, and then Perkins headed to Mizzou while also telling us it's not about the money. Now, I retweeted that and didn't offer any opinion of my own. And this is a scenario where I have a ton of respect for Tony. I get along, I got along great with Tony this year. I just don't think that's honest. Um, I do know I, I can confirm that a certain school did offer a a substantial amount of money. I don't know that Mizzou matched it, um, but Fran was not far off in those public comments. He made about half a million dollars going for Tony Perkins. So, I you know, I, I didn't dwell on it too much. He's headed to Missouri. That's that. Um, but to say it's not about the money when you're going to a team that lost every single conference game this year, mm, I don't know if I believe you, Tony. I, I'm a believer in Dennis Gates. I think they just really had a tough year, just a really in-between year. They got some good recruiting classes coming in. Gates rushes it in the portal. He's really good in the portal. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't really watch them super closely. Those are two things I know about Dennis Gates, and those are two things I know about the Missouri basketball program. So... Uh, I don't really don't have much else to say on that. I don't know if you guys agree. I, I again, I'm not dwelling on it too much. Uh, so the yeah the it wouldn't surprise me if he went with something that was not the highest offer, and that is as in probably in his eyes, that's enough clearance for it wasn't all about the money, but also it had to be a lot about the money. And I also, just a, a little word to athletes in general, especially younger athletes. It's okay when it's about the money. It is like the people who complain about athletes just chasing dollars, they would do the same thing themselves, virtually any of them. And for smaller amounts than what we're talking about here. Uh, I believe it was Hunter Dickinson when he made that first, like he was the first big, big NIL splash transfer because he went from Michigan, who was very successful, to Kansas. And he said it was essentially about the money. And it was rumored to be $1.7 million. Uh, and whether or not that was actually the case, it was, it was high up there. And that was his market value. And it was an opportunity for him to get that. And, and I believe he said, you know, most people, given the opportunity, would absolutely change careers for just $10,000. And we're talking about more money than that. So 
I think just in terms of sheer honesty, just say it's about the money. Just or or or, or call it a commitment to winning, right? But at some level, it can't be a taboo that athletes are getting their own market value actually compensated for the first time in decades. Because that is the biggest story out of all this to me, is that Tony Perkins's market value is more than what Iowa could pay for. But it's his market value because someone wants to pay it for him. Ellie, you've got, you are dying to say something. <laughs> or just say, go Tigers and leave it at that. Or, or that too. Yeah, yeah. Tell the truth or at least don't lie. Right. That's or, what I'm or, saying. Or just pick a uh pick an easy way to lie by omission. You yeah, know, like right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like I, I wish he would just say, Yeah, Mizzou offered me money and an opportunity. And and I also think I'm gonna get along with this coach. Uh, but you know, I've I've never heard anything bad come from Tony about Fran or vice versa. And I don't think that's gonna start now. You know, those two had a very fruitful and productive relationship with each other, even though it's not going to end with each other. Uh, so I, the, the, the people that sort of teed off on, on Tony on social media, it's, it's not a great look. It doesn't make Iowa fans look good at all. And it's, it's also sort of a reminder that just because fans didn't really like Perkins for whatever reason, and, and most of it's just tied to the fact that Iowa still hasn't made a sweet 16 since 1999, but, you know, teams, fan bases often put those shortcomings on their best players when they've got nobody else to blame. And, and so I think a little bit of the frustration with Perkins was that, you know, Iowa didn't, you know, fix the drought while he was the, you know, head man on campus. So, you know, despite that, despite the, well, he's not that good, despite the, and, and he really did struggle with, um, consistency at times but despite that the fact is that tony perkins like you said was a half million dollar guy in the portal and there's so many io fans that were in denial about that or that that accused fran of essentially making that up i think we we all saw that on social media too so it's sort of a nice little reminder that whatever sort of fan biases there are in terms of how good we think these players are or, or should be compensated or, or this or that, ultimately market value is a lot higher than people want it to be, than, than fans want it to be. They, they, they want it tied to some, like, oh, you make a final four, maybe you get a half million dollars. Uh-uh, that, that is not the landscape and you can wish it away all you want, but this is the reality now. And so there's going to have to be some way for Iowa to figure that out where these discussions are going to keep happening about these, you know, talented players that come through Iowa city. Like how is Iowa going to start retaining these guys? Where's that money going to come from? So Elliot, what, what's been sort of the um, scuttlebutt that you've heard about uh, NIL and Iowa's availability there, especially with uh, Alba over their names, bringing in the big guns. Well, uh, what I can, what I can tell you is it's, not as <laughs> it's it, they don't have as much money as Mizzou does apparently. <laughs> that, that's that's what I'll say. Um, and, and you know, I think folks can read into that to the degree that who are they targeting in the portal? Mid major players, and that might be a cultural thing. They just were they're looking for fit more than guys who are looking for dollars or big names. Um, but we do know that Drew Thelwell was on campus today and yesterday, and that Cameron Hunter will be on campus on the 18th and 19th. The 18th and 19th, Cameron Hunter, that is per Tobias Bass from uh, The Athletic, he was first to report. And uh, if you want to see the schools that are also showing interest in Hunter, you can find that on on our premium board and learn more about how the Thelwell visit went um, on uh on iowa.rivals.com backslash subscribe if you're not a subscriber yet we got great intel um on that and um so we'll see how how things come to fruition there and if the portal continues to pick up for iowa if they decide if if well if they land hunter if they land Thelwell, um and and more so 
Um, again, you can learn more about uh, Fellwell and that visit on iowithoutrivals.com if you're a premium subscriber. And we will have intel on, on Cameron Hunter as well um, once that visit comes together. But after these visits, we're going to learn more as to who they're going to continue to target, um, if they're going to continue to target more players in the portal, uh, if anybody else decides to leave. Of course, we expect Peyton Sanford to come back as well. Um, but lots to continue to pay attention to in the portal for, for men's basketball as well. Ross, anything you want to add there? Any, any questions, any questions you have for me, the, the men's beat writer on the site? No. Um, cool. Well, then we can head to a, a fun, fun portion of, of the pod here talking about spring ball coming up the open practice on Saturday. I believe the temperature, it's going to be a little chilly compared to what it was. I'm pulling my phone out here. I think I saw 50 degrees for Saturday. The folks that are planning on being there. Uh, yes, 49, we get the 70 degree weather and it's going to be a high of 49 on Saturday. And, uh, I can tell you that when you're sitting in those, um, in those seats, one, that that high of 49 is not going to come during the open practice. So we're really talking like you're you're sitting in like the middle of the weather, 45 degrees. It's probably going to be windy. Like it is, it's not going to be the most fun. I'm I'm trying to remember which year it was. I want to say it was 2015 or 2016, but there it that was um one of those years where it was just brutally cold. It was like probably 40 degrees and, and silly me i had just shown up with like one long sleeve shirt and uh, uh but it, it was the year that they made the um that they they set down the the final beam of construction for the children's hospital so that's why i was there to, to see it too and I, I was also seated a couple rows in front of um the family of this uh third string tight end who was really struggling to to get on the field? Uh, a, a George Kittle. I'm I'm trying to remember if anything ever came of that guy's career, but yeah, the um, the the one thing that I remembered very uh, clearly from sitting in front of the Kittle family was one of them. Again, bit, uh, I shouldn't say bitterly cold in Iowa because it was above freezing. <laughs> it didn't feel like it was above freezing, but one of them was in shorts and a t-shirt. And I learned a little bit about the Kittle family that day. But yeah, um, bundle up, fans. <laughs> it's not going to be fun there on Saturday. Oh, well, the, the weather's not going to be fun. The football should be fun. Yes. Uh, a couple things that we'll be paying attention to. We each came together. Well, we each did this separately, but uh, now we're coming together. Three things that each of us are watching for spring ball on Saturday coming up here in Kinnick Stadium. With this in mind, I we, I needed to hit it before we talk too much about spring ball uh, coming up on Saturday. Jacob Bostic entering the portal today, um, just days after he was telling us about how he was looking forward to playing in this offense. So, I mean, I was surprised. I, there was a little bit of rumblings about it on our board. Um, but I, I just just kind of like, no, right after right after he's talking so positively. Um, I think he's a player that a lot of Iowa fans were excited about. I was very excited about. I was excited to talk to him for the first time in in my year and a half on the beat. Awesome guy. I had a great conversation with him, uh, and I made sure to ask, you prefer Jake or Jacob? Because I was pretty sure we were going to be having some more conversations, <laughs> and then I found out that he's in the portal. But, of course, best of luck to him. Um, again, great guy. Uh, really was again really looking forward to that first catch at, at Iowa because he's got the talent. He I think he was a high three star for us, a five seven three star, um, and he was a, a receiver that Iowa needed in terms of of depth and and talent going into this season. Uh, yeah. With uh, now just Caleb Brown and Seth Anderson <laughs> being the two players, the two receivers that are older than redshirt freshmen that are on scholarship. And we know Alex Moda was in a cast at uh, spring ball the other day as well. So that's another scholarship receiver down. They're down to, I think, let me see if I can list them all. Caleb Brown, Seth Anderson, Jarriet Bowie, and Dayton Howard. Is that all the scholarship receivers? Because Caden, Caden Weijin's not on scholarship, even though he plays. Um, I think that's it. That's it. I think you're right. With Without Moda, yeah. 
Let me look at our scholarship chart, but um, that's that's something of note. I, how did you guys were you were you surprised, Ross? You wrote the the article about him hitting the portal. Were were you surprised like I was? Yeah, I mean, I was definitely a little surprised because you know I, I read your article, I, I I listened to the quotes, and he did not sound like a guy who had you know one foot out the door. But um, I was also not completely shocked just because I think that's the the world we live in right now in terms of the transfer portal and uh, you know, immediate eligibility. Um, it's just one of those things where I, I think things like this are going to be a little more normal than they have been, at least unless there are changes in the way the portal operates, you know, from the NCAA or, or some other force. Um, it, it's just going to have to be something I think that, fans and also you know us media get used to in terms of this is the way things are now but yeah i i did not you know everybody that could have left you know from this team he would not have been in my top five for sure because he sounded like a guy who was very excited to be a part of tim lester's offense uh you know he wanted to get that first catch at iowa um there were just a lot of reasons to think hey this is the guy that wants to be here he's going to be a guy that you know maybe isn't a starter uh in the fall but it's going to be a guy that is definitely a part of that wide receiver rotation, uh, or so we thought. But now he he will not be. So, so the five names we got are the five that will be a well, four that will be available considering Moda's injury. Four that will be available on Saturday. I'm I'm assuming that Moda's out. I mean, he wasn't in a cast, but it was pretty heavily wrapped. Um, and come fall you're going to add Reese Vanderzee and KJ Parker to that rotation. Now, two three-star receivers, Vanderzee, while he looks great in pads at the high school level, he's going to be thin for a Division I receiver. He just ran 14.76 in the 110 highs the other day, which is pretty damn fast. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how fast he runs this season. He's probably going to be a Drake, probably going to, probably going to be competing for a state title here soon. And KJ Parker is one of the more dynamic players that Iowa has brought in at the receiver spot. I'm really looking forward to see what he does, but to expect them to come in and contribute right away is probably unlikely, especially, especially after not being here in the spring, though, Jerry at Bowie did get time on, on the field this last year. So though he didn't receive a catch, we'll see. We've also been hearing positive things about Dayton Howard. I haven't heard much about Jarrett Bowie, um, but, but, we may well. And and I think other, other players were saying it, maybe I just wasn't around, but with all of that out there, we've got our list of three things that we're, we're watching. Adam, you have something to chime in here. One more name to, to add to the scholarship receivers and well, we'll count them as half a scholarship receiver, but it's TJ Washington. Yep. And, and I, I, I sort of wonder if he's been productive enough at the receiver spot and, and they're sort of, from what I can tell, sort of thinking of him as sort of like a Percy Harvin, like wingback, like move him wherever you want. But if he's been productive enough receiving, that that might sort of change Bostic's calculus in terms of what he thinks he's going to be able to bring to the table for the Hawkeyes, what kind of snap count he thinks he's in for, maybe. But other than that, I'm not quite sure in terms of football reasons, what would prompt the move to the portal now for Bostic? But yeah, other than that, that's it. Just want to throw Washington's name in there too. I was thinking that and then I got distracted, but thank yeah. you for adding that in. Uh, I did talk to him about that today. Ross will be writing an article about the running backs and then the quasi running back in there in TJ Washington. So that should be up on the site here sooner rather than later. And that lightens the load of scholarships in that running back group, though he probably could receive snaps at that running back spot too, just because he does have that versatility. Now on to the three things that each of us will be watching, which we're going to try to keep this relatively short here. Um, going into to spring ball on, on Saturday, I'll start and say the obvious one, offense, the offense. Are we going to be seeing RPOs? Are we going to be seeing post-snap reads? Because one thing that I don't think got included in an article yet uh, regarding Tim Lester's offense is Deacon Hill saying it was on YouTube, though, if you want to find it on YouTube, it's just Elliot Clough Rivals, and I can include it in the description. 
uh, Deacon said there have been some post snap reads. I don't know if he was just trying to, you know, deter or, you know, veer off from the question, but that is something that I'm very much looking forward to. And I think, and, and to throw in, you know, motion and uh, yeah, pre-snap motion in there, throwing off the defense's eyes. Are we going to see big plays? We saw some big plays last year from Deacon Hill and in, in the offense, one crazy catch by Deontay Vines, one Deacon Hill found, uh, Addison Ostrenga up the seam and I don't want folks to overreact to spring ball because folks have done that every year and what happens to the offense it's the worst in the country so that's the first thing I think it's on all of our lists though Adam I know you you went a bit of a di different direction uh here yeah I mean it's it's more or less the same thing but I I just went a little bit more granular and just said uh, I, I'm looking for Deacon Hill's decision making uh, how quick is it? And are is he making the right reads? It, essentially, has the game started to slow down for him yet? It, we we got some hints of that during the season when Iowa went on that winning streak in the Big Ten. But by and large, he's a guy that really has not had the game slow down for him yet. Or, or at the very least, hadn't really had that happen for him by the Tennessee game. And Clearly, he's got a strong arm. Clearly, he's got that. What else is he putting together? So I'm I'm looking for just signs of development, whether it is like his um, footwork and, and his other mechanics. Are, are those looking sharper? Are they in tune with where his throws and reads are supposed to go? Because we had heard from Tim Lester that that was part of putting these plays together is you know, does it fit with the timing of their dropbacks? Like that's the level of granularity that he coaches with. So are we seeing any of that improvement from Deacon Hill or is this just going to be another situation of, well, hope McNamara is healthy. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that the most. Are, are we doing yeah. one through three per, or is it Ross's turn? Ross's turn. Yay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I was just going to say that first, Elliot, it is a cherished tradition to overreact to spring football. So, you know, I, I don't I don't think we can look past that. But um, Sorry. my number one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, my number one thing was along the same lines as, as both of yours. And it was the quarterbacks. You know what? What what's Deacon Hill looking like? You know, new offense, uh, more experience like Adam said, has it slowed down for him? Is he making better decisions? You know, how, how does that look? And then Marco uh, as well, like, how is he looking? Is he, uh, you know, is he, is his throwing ability improving? Is he able to make the throws that Iowa needs in order for that offense to succeed? Um, is he, you know, are there more running plays? Is, uh, you know, is he a weapon in, in an RPO or something? So, you know what, Ultimately, I think quarterback in the spring game is kind of a, you know, it's, it, we'll see something, but it's not what we really want to see, which is what does this offense look like with Cade McNamara running it? Because that's what everybody's really hoping and wanting to see this fall is Cade McNamara healthy quarterbacking Iowa for 12 games and, you know, beyond. Um, and we're not going to see any, any hint of that on Saturday because he's obviously still, uh, rehabbing from his knee injury so we can just make do with what we have I guess which is how are Deacon and Marco looking because obviously they had to come in last year um, Marco not to the bowl game obviously but and the offense you know we don't need to rehash the numbers or anything everybody remembers it was brutal it was really really brutal and hopefully they're not relied on you know to play as much this fall Kate's healthy he can go but if they are going to have to play, hopefully they can play at a higher level uh, than what we saw last year. And at least Saturday gives us, you know, one sliver um, of information about how they're looking at least. So that's, that's on my agenda. In regards to personnel, I, I was going to say, are we going to see more of Deacon or are we going to see more of Marco? Because what we were told by Deacon is that he's been receiving the majority of, if not all of the reps with the ones. Is it going to stay that way? Are folks going to be chanting Marco, Marco? Because they can't chant, chant fire Brian anymore. 
<laughs> they're gonna be it's gonna be one of the two so that that's gonna be a big emphasis i think for everybody on on saturday and are we gonna see when marco does get inevitably get reps are we gonna see that read option are we gonna see him pull it and take off because that's gonna get people excited and if he completes a few passes instead of going two for seven for seven yards that's gonna get people clamoring for him to get the reps with the ones um and now you know Cade's gonna be supposedly all the way back in june that's what we were told by by kirk so we'll see what what happens there but um that's that's definitely something that co- kind of coincides for all of us and then on to the second point for myself and and we'll see what you guys think here um and i guess i know i know adam's gonna agree with me man i can't wait to see reese take and punt i was at i was at spring practice on thursday last week and that was the one thing that i missed i was over uh jimmy sullivan was visiting 2025 quarterback uh commit and i wanted to see gavin hoffman so those were two things that were and the wide receivers for that matter and the quarterbacks so those four things were of utmost priority for me apparently reese was out there punting and i missed it somebody told me that he has a, a leg we talked to him today of course which you can read on iowa.rivals.com but I'm I'm very much looking forward to what he does in front of a crowd um, and and just see what we have yet to see in person. I really can't wait to see him punt. Yeah, so for my number two, and, and spoiler alert, Reese Staken was absolutely my number three. <laughs> but, but how can you not be excited about a guy like that, uh, especially when he's somebody who was essentially earmarked for – the Iowa program as the successor successor for Tory Taylor. So, uh, you know, everything that we've seen off of the clips that have been coming out of Pro Kick Australia uh, has been blowing Iowa fans' skirts up, to say the least. But, uh, yeah, in terms of actually seeing it on the field, uh, you know, there there's no substitute for that. So let's say uh, stop talking. Would... We're going to get demonetized too. <laughs> but no. Uh, so, so my number two of what I'm looking for is what is going to happen to the point of attack when the first string Iowa offensive line and defensive line are going up against each other, because obviously Caden Proctor's absence is going to be felt to some extent. But it's the absence of those expectations more than the absence of any reps that he ever had on the line, right? He he was always just some sort of apparition more than uh, an actual cornerstone of the Hawkeye line. But it also means that now, all right, uh, you're you're looking at Mason Richmond again, and and so if it's really going to go Richmond, Stevens, Jones, Colby, Dunker, which is what we were given on the. Uh, depth chart to start the um, spring season are any of them pushing an Iowa defensive lineman outside of the point of attack are they moving where this line is is going because I, I you can usually tell within the first five minutes of a game if one team is moving that point of attack on both sides of the line they don't win a hundred percent of the time, but it's pretty close. And there, there have been a few games where you could tell pretty quick that Iowa was going to be in trouble against the Michigans, against the Tennessees, um, against Ohio State in Columbus. Even when the Hawkeyes had that early lead, you're like, yeah, but they're not, they're not winning in the trenches. So show me who on that offensive line is winning in the trenches. Because it better be somebody, uh, because they are going up against the sort of line that they're going to see in the Big Ten more weeks than not. Like Iowa's line is great, but there's a lot of really, really good lines too. So let me see where some of that development has been happening, because you can't really use Proctor as an excuse very long. Not when the season starts. At, at that point, it's a like you know, excuses don't put wins in the W column. It's a, all right, here's the guys you got. Who on that line is going to be blocking at an all Big Ten level? That's what I want to see. Uh, Ross, how about you? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think, you know, the offensive line is going to be a huge point of emphasis this year. And so seeing how they look this spring, um, are they making strides? That's huge because 
based on what we saw last year, like that level of performance isn't going to get it done for the offense. So uh, how much they're improved is going to be really critical. Uh, my second thing was also on the offensive side. Shocker that we're all interested in the Iowa offense, I think. Who, who would have guessed? Um, but it's about the receivers. And it is, you know, we've got new receiver coach, new offensive coordinator with, you know, new new scheme, new play design. Um, how's that working out? What do the plays look like? Are the receivers getting separation? Um, are they catching the ball? <laughs> you know, what do their hands look like? Are they, you know, holding onto the ball? We Drops were a not insignificant problem for the Iowa offense uh, last year, among, you know, many other things. Like, there were lots of issues. But that was one of them. You know, have has it gotten better this spring? Um, the downside is, you know, what we've already talked about, which is that there aren't a lot of bodies at the receiver position right now. So, you know, we're pretty limited in, in who we're going to get to look at. But, you know, Caleb Brown and Seth Anderson are going to be hugely important players this fall. They're going to be there on Saturday. Um, so, yeah, how do they look? You know, what what sort of routes are they running? Um, you know, yeah, like I said, what kind of separation are they getting? And are they just hanging on to the dang ball? Because that's going to tell us a lot about, or at least give us some idea of how successful uh, this passing offense might have a shot at being, I think. So one thing I wanted to add to your second point, and this can be my third point because I had a list and it mostly about personnel. When we're talking about the offensive line and if they can get push on the defensive line, what I'm curious about is that second string defensive tackle position, because that was going to be a position Iowa would go after in the portal if they had scholarships to use, um, but they don't. So they'll, they'll probably still do something in the portal before fall, whether that's adding a second quarterback or adding to the offensive line. Some more stuff is going to happen. More players are going to leave here in the portal. And players will have to deal with with medicals as well. So more to happen because they have to get to 85 scholarships for the season before the coming season. So more is bound to happen one way or another. Now to that de backup defensive tackle spot behind YA Black and Aaron Graves, who are dominant. It's Jeremiah Pittman, who's good, and Luke Gaffney, who's unproven. Behind them, it's some question marks. So, are Gaffney and Pittman good enough to be those backup, those those the three tech and the one tech behind YA Black and Aaron Griggs? Are they going to be able to rotate like we've seen in years past? Because the defensive line group is among the most deep groups typically at Iowa. It was last year. Now you lose Logan Lee, you lose Ontario Thompson to the portal, you lose Joe Evans. So this is a scenario where you're at a, I don't, I don't want to say deficit, but you're at a position where you're not as deep as you once were. The defensive end group going to be good again. You got Deontay Craig, you got Ethan Herkett, you got Max Llewellyn, you got potentially Brian Allen. Um, that that's 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 it, right? Was there another defensive end that I'm missing? I feel like there is, but Brian Allen's in there. He's he's a really high potential guy. Ross, do you have anything? Did you say Max Llewellyn? I did. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to affirm, I think you got, th those are the four big guys for sure. I don't think you overlooked uh, anyone significant. Okay. Well, it's it's the defensive tackle group and and their depth is, is something that I'm looking to going into uh, Saturday. Uh, so my number three, uh, again, was restaken. So I, I don't think we need to belabor that one too much. But yeah, the um, I, I really like the story that uh, you published today, um, just about him talking about the uh, level of fame that he was dealing with being noticed as a uh, as the Hawkeyes next punter at the airport, but not even in the Cedar Rapids airport in Dallas. So like that is that's how much punting is winning in Iowa City. So he is he's he's stepping into some big shoes, even though he doesn't want to be compared directly to Tory Taylor. Uh, Reese, sorry, buddy. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll try to accommodate your requests as best as we can, but it it is so 
self-evidently like the comparison to be made. So uh, looking forward to see how he performs, especially in those like blustery conditions that are inevitably waiting. Like this is what fall's going to be like too, buddy. So let's, let's see how it's working out for you now. But uh, so far it sounds like everybody's excited for it and uh, count me among them. Uh, Ross, what's your number three? Yeah. So I think my number three is, um, actually the linebackers and more specifically the backup linebackers, because we know a lot about the starters. Um, they're all back. They're all extremely proven, just, you know, tremendous leadership talent there. No, no questions at all about those guys, but the back, the, the number twos, you know, Harold, um, and, and the rest of the guys, what are they, you know, what are they bringing to the table? What are they, uh, looking like, can they push for more playing time? Um, because, you know, sooner rather than later, they're going to be the guys that are in the middle of that Iowa defense. They're going to be the ones taking the reins from uh, Higgins and Jackson. And um, so, you know, this should be an opportunity to get a little bit of a look at how, how they're playing. Um, you know, what can they do? Uh, what, what kind of drop off is there? Are they, you know, they've got to be hungry. Obviously, they haven't been able to play much. So. Um, you know, what does that look like when they get on the field? Uh, are other things they do differently or better than the other guys? So, I mean, we just don't think we know a lot about that unit, the backups, and um, they're going to be important uh, at some point because they're going to be the starters. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious to see how that's developing, basically. Last thing I want to drop in, it was a name that I said earlier, Gavin Hoffman. I want to see how he's acclimated. You can tell he's gained weight. He's a guy that a lot of people were looking forward to from this 24 class. Um, and uh, I want to see how he compares to other guys who have maybe been doing it for a little bit longer. So very excited about Gavin Hoffman, not just on Saturday, but his future as tight end at Iowa. Um, and potentially a dude. I, I definitely uh, saw a little bit of that on, on, I think it was Thursday that, we watched him in practice. So looking forward to Saturday. And of course, you can look forward to more coverage of spring football. We'll be talking to the coordinators on Thursday. Um, Tim Lester. Uh, oh, I, uh, Phil Parker. <laughs> Phil Parker and LeVar Woods. I was looking for LeVar Woods name. So uh, then I just wrote about it today. But anyway, those three will be uh, speaking to the media on Thursday. And of course, we'll get some players in Kirk after the spring practice on Saturday, which is open to the public. Feel free to stop by Kinnick Stadium. If you don't, we'll have coverage from Kinnick, uh, pictures, video, going to be a bunch of recruits there as well. So uh, I'll I'll be right on top of that. We'll, we, we will have a preview for all the visitors that will be there on Saturday as well. That'll be out here within the next few days. So thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Hotcast. We're going to wrap it up right here. And don't forget, before you get out of here, hit that like button, drop a, a subscribe as well for us on YouTube, drop a comment, let us know what you're thinking about Saturday, the portal, Caitlin being drafted number one, Kate heading to uh, Las Vegas as well. And if you are listening on Apple Pad Podcast, Spotify, Google Play, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode and leave a rate and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It helps us out a lot and it makes us very happy for now. I am Elliot Clough at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by publisher Adam Jacoby and managing editor Ross Binder, and we will see you next time.